Audiences have been enthralled and divided by royal drama The Crown since it debuted on our screen seven years ago. The first half of the final series will be released next week, unfortunately marking the beginning of the end for the hit show. The latest episodes will portray the fallout from Charles and Diana's divorce and, of course, her tragic death as well. Let's have a look. All one wants is for that girl to find peace. Mommy, you okay? I'm okay. It's just. It has all been a bit mad recently. Is royal historian and author Tessa Dunlop, who's one of only two journalists to have had a sneak preview of the new series. My gosh, what a privileged position you found yourself in. Yes, it was the most extraordinary experience. It was just me and one other, and we were allowed to watch the first four episodes because this final series has been split in two, and there's two different actors for William and two for Harry, and the end of this first four is Diana's death and how that is dealt with. So they're kind of self-contained, if you like. And it was an incredibly intense three or so hours, mm. spent with a man considerably younger than me, because halfway through I realised he was in mere nappies, darling, when <laughs> Diana died. Whereas for me, as a daughter of Diana with her Ladybird book onwards, yeah. this was the most seismic moment in my young adult life, I dare. Yeah, well, I remember it very, very clearly. I'm pretty much the same age that she would have been, I think a year, and maybe a year younger than she would have been. And I mean, I remember, you know, waking up to it. It's an yeah. absolute yeah. devastation. I took my little girls straight to Kensington Palace with white flowers. Everyone was crying. I was working those days uh, on the big breakfast on the bed and we, mm. we just took a desk and just put it in the road outside Buckingham Palace. Yeah. And we just turned on the cameras live in the morning yeah. and just people just poured towards me, just wanting to yeah. say how devastated they were. I mean, it really was cataclysmic at the time. And one of the things I always thought was that people who said it was a kind of hysteria and it was ridiculous mm. were quite wrong. They just didn't realise how people really felt. Yeah, and also, and what I thought they captured brilliantly in this series was it reminded me of how, at that time, Diana was everywhere. Oh, yes. There was no democratisation in terms of what we receive or watch with streaming and social media. She was front and centre in all the newses, in all the newsstands, in every newspaper, in every magazine. So, of course, when she died, it literally felt like we were in free fall. Yes, it was absolutely shocking. And, really, and, and people really felt shocking. they knew her. Lots yes. of people had seen her at things. Lots of people felt that had they met her, she'd have been their best friend. Yes. People felt very sorry for her. People felt inspired by her because she was gorgeous and glamorous and beautiful and a lovely mother. I mean, everything was just so everything. huge. So tell me about the programme itself and how it feels watching the recreation of those well, days. Well, what's interesting is we know the story. Yeah. And yet still, and to my surprise, because I'm not a sentimentalist, I did find myself in floods of tears in the final episode of this first full block. I found several takeaways that I was impressed with because we know it's hugely sensitive. People have very strong feelings about the royal family and this series. I wonder almost secretly if Peter Morgan isn't going for a gong because he somehow managed to come away from the depiction of that really painful period, both creating a Charles we sympathised with mm. and a Diana we loved. And I thought that was very gifted directing and I also felt much more comfortable this series with Elizabeth Debicki and Dominic West playing the respective key protagonists. I think it's almost I've got used to them yeah. you know when you're first adjusting your eye thinking that's not the right and but, but now I'm comfortable and actually I felt a bit like Diana came into herself in her 30s so did Debicki she is amazing and just brilliant costumes, the backdrop of Saint-Tropez, this extraordinary love affair, the tension. But you know, one of the really big takeaways for me, Vanessa, was the bonkers world those boys grew up in. It is a miracle they are as normal as they are, to Give be Give me honest. an example. What did you see well, that was, was bonkers? Just being shuttled in private jets, to private yachts in Saint-Tropez, then returning to stay randomly with a, a nanny before being shoved up to Icy Balmoral. One line, I'm not meant to give a granular to detail less, but I'm sure they won't mind, where Diana goes, oh, Scotland, full of dead animals and rain, or some such, yeah. you know? And, and the juxtaposition of the two worlds, the sort of ebullient, over-the-top 
colour and craziness of Dodi Fayed and his moccasins and, and, and what might come, and the press, of course, preying on it all, and then tucked away in Balmoral with stags. And, 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 and how did you feel about Because obviously we feel very differently watching something we don't remember, something yeah. that was history that didn't really apply to us, that we'd heard of, and you watch it and it's a bit like a costume drama, even though the people are real. You still watch it through a sort of veil of mists of time and everything else. But when it's people that we remember and we remember it, and also her children, are still alive to watch it, of yeah. course. Her ex-husband, her brother, her sisters, you know, her, her grandchildren. I mean, everybody's around to see this. Did you did you feel at all that it's too soon? I didn't because the story's so well known. But the other gift for this series is that we don't actually know what happened between Diana and Dodie. So you therefore are well aware that the directors entered into a fantasy realm. And you so were well aware. I was, Lots of people I think watching will people, think it's a historical documentary no, most they people. have all the way through. Let me ask you about the ghost, because we've yeah. heard lots of publicity about that there is the ghost of Diana. Yeah. Is that what it's like, an actual ghost? Yeah, she, she comes back and she has a chat with Charles and with How her late about majesty, that? the Queen. It, I mean, she wasn't sort of faded. It was, it, it, there, there was one actor talking to another actress. I was so wrapped up in my own... The, my, the own... The part that I played at that time, consuming the press, and my own culpability, our own culpability. Why are we culpable? Because we all devoured her. We, we devoured yeah, her we narrative. Didn't, we didn't contribute to her dying in a car crash in no, Paris. No, We're not culpable. No, but we didn't. But the crazy juggernaut, the world we expected them to live in and to live normally in, it was a lot of pressure for I think them. some of the time it was, and some of the time she was just getting her hair done and going to the gym and having a biscuit like everybody else. But you could argue for the boys as children, and I think that was the other thing. Harry is a very faint presence in this first four episodes. And what you take away is he, he didn't really have his mum so much. William was much older, was across the narrative. He's a much bigger protagonist. Mm. And it almost helped me make sense of the kind of Sussex stuff that we've had churning out over the last 18 months. This is kind of Harry playing catch up almost. And bizarrely, I know The Crown is a fictionalised drama, but it helped me make sense of why he's almost come late to the party of grief. So really, you make it sound as if this is a must watch and we should definitely watch uh, well, it. Well, I'm can. biased. Come on, I'm biased. But <laughs> I, I, it, was, it, was a, it was a morning well worth spending Tessa alone. Tessa Dunlop, thank you so much.